All right, so now we're going to talk about the pharmacology of psychotic disorders. Um, <clears throat> mainly what we'll be talking about is, uh, is schizophrenia, and these are a bunch of drugs that are listed for psychosis. And uh, your prototypes, this one right here, Risperidol or res res uh, uh, Risperidone is the... Uh, is the uh, is the name, the generic name of that. So let's look at what psychosis is. Um, <clears throat> so psychosis would be a, a set of behaviors, okay? So severe mental and behavioral disorders characterized by delusions, hallucinations, illusions. So the difference between delusions and illusions is delusions tend to be more in the brain. A lot of times there's a story associated with them, kind of kind of tries to make it fit. Uh, illusions can be sensory, more visual types of things, and then hallucinations. Hallucinations can be auditory or uh, or uh, or visual. So disorganized behavior, difficulty relating to others, paranoia is a lot of times associated with this. You think people are out to get you, and it can be acute, which means it occurs over hours or days. And we see this a lot with uh, an overdose of certain medications, especially medications that increase dopamine levels, which we'll see that dopamine is really important for, uh, for psychosis and particularly schizophrenia. So a lot of times with illicit drugs like amphetamines, um, <laughs> a lot of times if somebody overdoses on like methamphetamine, they'll start showing psychosis. They'll have schizophrenia-like behaviors and, uh, you know, they're their friends, deadbeat friends, a lot of times will just drop them off at the uh, emergency room door and then, you know, push them out of the car and then drive away. So, um, and those are treated with antipsychotics, particularly they're treated with uh, something called haloperidol, um, which is a an antipsychotic. It's a first generation antipsychotic, as we will see. So schizophrenia is the main thing we're talking about here, uh, or schizophrenia spectrum disorders. And, um, it's the most common psychiatric or psychotic disorder manifests in men between ages of 15 to 24. That doesn't mean it has to be in that range. That's just typically when we see it. In women, it's between 25 to 34. So it manifests not as necessarily as children, but in the later years when your brain is going through its last phases of uh, of development and there are some clues as to what's going on there, a lot of hypotheses as to why that's the case. It tends to cycle with acute episodes followed by more lucid periods. So medications, we want to kind of even that out. We want to uh, keep the lucid periods obviously, but we want to kind of minimize those, those acute episodes. So characteristics, some of the things we just saw, abnormal thoughts, thought processes, disordered communication, withdrawal from other people in the outside environment. One thing we really don't think about too much with schizophrenia is that these patients uh, also tend to be severely depressed and there is a, a higher risk for, for suicide. So it's definitely something that uh, needs to be addressed and needs to be treated. So there's also something called schizoaffective disorder. So when we're talking about affect, we're usually talking about mood. So that's patient exem exhibits symptoms of both schizophrenia and mood disorder. So that's where you get schizo and affective. Distorted perceptions and delusions followed by extreme depression. There's your, your kind of bipolar-like symptoms. So positive and negative psychotic symptoms appear over time. So conditions, there are some conditions that may mimic schizophrenia. I've already mentioned like chronic amphetamine or cocaine use, uh, but cancer, brain cancers uh, can kind of get in there and, and uh, mess with brain function. Same with infections like, I don't know, meningitis or something like that. Hemorrhage, so head injuries can start to cause people to have uh, uh, schizophrenia-like like symptoms. So symptoms of schizophrenia, uh, we've talked about some of the actual symptoms, but these are kind of categorized into two, well, categories that are that are kind of important to know. Uh, positive symptoms and negative symptoms. Now, I don't necessarily like the terms used for positive and negative, but they make sense. Positive symptoms are things that are there that shouldn't be. Okay, so it's positive. You're expressing something that you shouldn't be uh, expressing. It doesn't mean that it's a good thing. It's not that kind of positive, but uh, abnormal behavior added to normal behavior. So that's where we get the hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, uh, strange and irrational behavior and actions. 
uh, stuff that you want to get rid of. Rapid alternation between extreme hyperactivity and stupor. Okay, so these are these are behaviors that we want to get rid of. Negative symptoms are behaviors that are missing that we want to get back. So these are subtracted from normal behavior. So lack of motivation or detachment, uh, deterioration of hygiene, job, and academic performance. So these are things that are missing. Withdrawal from social and interpersonal relationships. Uh, the reason these are these are kind of separate is is because the uh, the conventional antipsychotics do a pretty good job at restoring positive symptoms, or I'm sorry, of getting rid of positive symptoms, but not so good with negative symptoms. And some of the atypicals that we're going to go over uh, are much better at treating the negative symptoms as well as the positive symptoms. And we'll talk about some of the, uh, the neuro uh, nervous system activities that are causing that. So causes, speaking of causes, what what we know, what we don't know. We don't really know what causes schizophrenia. Uh, we do know that there's a genetic component because if you do like they've done studies with identical twins where if one identical twin gets schizophrenia, the other one has a 50-50 chance, which is a really high risk, but it kind of says, okay, there's a genetic component, but he's, the other one's not guaranteed of getting it, like you would see with Huntington's disease. If it's Huntington's, you get it or you don't get it. Uh, with schizophrenia, there's obviously some kind of uh, environmental uh, component that's that's associated with it. So um, we just don't know what that is. Uh, neurotransmitter and or neurotransmitter receptor imbalance. So a lot of uh, what we know about that comes from just drug treatments. We know that if you give a drug that blocks dopamine receptors, particularly the dopamine D2, there are a lot of different dopamine receptors, but this particular receptor, if you block that one, you tend to take away some of those positive symptoms. And, uh, and so that's an indication that dopamine is definitely involved. They've done studies that show that dopamine levels are higher in patients with schizophrenia. So symptoms seem to be associated with dopamine, particularly that uh, type 2 or the D2 receptor in the brain. And uh, antipsychotic drugs enter dopaminergic synapses and compete with dopamine. So what we're saying here is these antipsychotic drugs always have at least partial, some level of dopamine antagonism. They antagonize dopamine receptors. Okay, uh, But we also have figured out that serotonin is involved um, because there are the new atypicals, the newer atypicals that were developed in the 70s, 80s. Those also antagonize serotonin receptors, particularly the serotonin 2A receptor. There are like 15 different serotonin receptors in the brain. And, uh, and so we know that serotonin also has an effect, and that's what they believe helps with the, with the negative symptoms. Okay, so selection. So no single drug of choice, but second-generation atypicals are usually your, your first line of treatment. There, and there are a lot of different uh, second-generation or even third-generation uh, I kind of group those together. Uh, selection of drug type depends on the clinici clin clinician's experience, uh, the patient needs because different um, different patients respond differently, and then side effects. Some some of these atypical antipsychotics, especially, will have uh, different types of side effects that may be more critical for one person versus the other. Um, patient drug compliance tends to be a problem. Uh, so the goal is to reduce psychotic symptoms so patients have the ability to self-care. Well, we have, really when it comes to antipsychotic drugs, they're pretty dirty. Okay? And by that, I mean that they aren't so targeted. They don't just target certain neurotransmitters. They actually hit a whole lot of different neurotransmitter receptors in the brain. Uh, and so once you have multiple neurotransmitter systems involved, you have more side effects. Okay? And... Uh, which is a whole, whole lot of fun for remembering the side effects, but um, but that can also interfere with uh, drug compliance. Okay, these these side effects. Maybe somebody doesn't want to you know gain a hundred pounds when they when they take their medications, if that's the problem. So drugs don't cure. They don't cure. They treat. So uh, you don't you don't your schizophrenia doesn't go away. Uh, you're just trying to control those symptoms. So patients must continue the drug regimen to remain in remission. So if uh, in 60 to 80% of the time 
if they go off the medication, it will come back and they will go back to their same old behavior. Um, I know the movie It's a Beautiful Mind and John Nash, he was able to sort of talk himself out of being schizophrenic uh, in a way. It was still there, but he, he managed to kind of overcome that. Um, but but that's not that's not very common. Okay, so these drugs fun function primarily as antagonists, and uh, we've already talked about dopamine and serotonin antagonism. But it's it's uh, other neurotransmitter receptors as well, which we'll see. And uh, like I said, that leads to a wide range of side effects. Speaking of side effects, the extrapyramidal system is uh, or extrapyramidal symptoms, but it's based on something called the extrapyramidal system or the pyramidal system or pyramidal tracks. So what do I mean by that? When your brain tells your body to move, it passes through these tracks. And for directed movement, if I want to move my arm, then my motor cortex up here would send a signal down to activate the muscles in my arm. Typically for directed conscious movement, it goes through this area. So if we were to take a cut here of the brain stem and turn it on its side, we would see that typically for directed conscious movement, I'll make that black instead, it goes through this area called the pyramid. And it's called that because it's shaped like a pyramid. However, those movements have to be kind of fine-tuned and coordinated. And those signals, a lot of times they come from different areas, will go through these regions called, well, we call them the extrapyramidal system. So if we're, if we're breaking this down, um, then we can say that, we can sort of see that, okay, directed movement, the patient's still able to move, but they, they lack a coordination. Um, they lack they lack overall control, which can lead to spasms because that some of that feedback isn't working right. Um, so they can have certain spasms, and this is this is kind of a list: muscle spasms of the face, tongue, neck, or back, uh, which we can call dystonias, acute dystonias, inability to rest and relax, pacing. Uh, so so that also would be would be kind of considered an an extra pyramidal uh, side effect. Uh, secondary or pseudo Parkinsonism, tremor, muscle rigidity, stoop like posture. Um, so, really, if you think about what Parkinson's disease is, it's an increase in dopamine. Okay, so so if you give something, uh, so so you can kind of see that um, that. Well, I'm sorry, I just said that wrong. Parkinson's is a decrease in dopamine. So if you give a medication that sort of decreases dopamine activity, then you're then it should make sense that you're going to see some Parkinson's-like effects. So tremor, muscle rigidity, stooped posture. Uh, now these may not all involve the extrapyramidal system, but they are categorized into this EPS or extrapyramidal uh, side effects. Um, tardive dyskinesia. The easiest way to remember that is tardive means delayed or slower. So tardive dyskinesias is a dyskinesia or movement disorder that's delayed and it's from long-term use. Okay, so so especially with the first generation or the uh, the conventional uh, psychotic antipsychotics, those when the patient is on those for a long time then they can start showing these dyskinesias, and they call that tardive dyskinesia, but that's it's kind of similar to uh, the dystonias and akathisia. Uh, lip smacking, worm-like movements of the tongue, uncontrolled chewing and grimacing. Okay, so so all of these things follow fall under this uh, EPS or extrapyramidal symptoms. Categories of antipsychotic drugs. I've been mentioning them. Well, here they are. Conventional or typical antipsychotics. I think we're, we're preferring the word conventional right now. Um, and these are the ones that mainly came out in the, in the 1950s. Chlor chlorpromazine, when it came out in the 1950s, it was revolutionary. I mean, finally, schizophrenic patients, you were able to control some of those uh, symptoms, mainly the positive symptoms, but still, uh, you, were, you were able to, there was at least a treatment available that could, could make them kind of function again somewhat. Um, they're categorized by phenothiazines and non-phenothiazines, which I don't think that's important right now. 
But um, one of the other drugs that you'll see is haloperidol or Haldol. You'll probably see a lot of that. And sometimes it's used when people come into the ER and they're acting crazy. You can give them uh, Haldol, haloperidol. So chlorpromazine, Thorazine, uh, but they do have uh, they do have side effects, especially movement side effects, especially with uh, with chlorpromazine. Uh, some of these extra pyramidal side effects can can occur. Uh, they call it the Thorazine shuffle. They walk with uh, with very short, quick steps, kind of stooped over, uh, have a hard time turning. It's just not very coordinated. Okay, so even though their their uh, positive symptoms are gone, they it does cause movement disorders. Atypicals came around in the 1970s, 1980s. They're also called second generation. They have fewer side effects, but they still have a lot. Okay, so, and the biggest difference for the atypicals is they could treat some of these negative symptoms as well as the positive symptoms. And then uh, sometimes people refer to third generation, which is also, uh, a, which is kind of in this category of atypical. Um, and, uh, they also work with this dopamine serotonin system and that's the big difference is is if you were to point to a big difference it would be that the conventionals are mainly dopamine and a whole bunch of other things the atypicals are mainly serotonin and dopamine with a whole bunch of other things and uh but in the case of the third generation some of those will uh, actually activate uh certain dopamine receptors as as well as be an, an antagonist Okay, so I hope that I hope that kind of makes sense. I don't usually try to separate out second and third generation. I just kind of kind of like to uh, keep that category of atypicals. All right, so again, uh, your your drugs for uh, so the conventional the examples: chlorpromazine, haloperidol, effective for positive symptoms more than negative. So if someone is on these, if you when we go over the side effects, this, this will kind of make more sense. But uh, first thing you want to do is make sure that they're actually, it's having an effect. It's decreasing those psychotic symptoms. Uh, you'll want to see that uh, anticholinergic side effects, anticholinergic side effects, we usually think of as kind of sympathetic nervous system, kind of a sympathetic nervous system kind of effects. Um, so you'll want to watch for those. You want to make sure they're not on alcohol, illegal drugs, caffeine, nicotine use, cardiovascular changes. And this is going to be kind of a uh, kind of important. Anytime you see cardiovascular problems, then that, you know, I mean, if you have uh, if you have certain kind of uh, if you have a cardiac issue or if a drug causes cardiac uh, concerns, whether they be dysrhythmias or whatever, uh, then that can kill people. So, so that's something to kind of always pay attention to. And uh, seizures, okay, can be a problem. There's something else that's specific to these drugs, and so we call them neuroleptics, antipsychotics, neuroleptics, pretty much the same thing. And it's called neuroleptic malignant syndrome, okay? So that is a toxicity of these neuroleptic, of these antipsychotic drugs. Okay, so they build up to too high of levels and they can cause a, uh, a problem that can be life-threatening. Um, it can be life-threatening largely uh, because it can cause unstable blood pressure and, uh, and uh, dysrhythmias. So what that is is elevated, elevated temperature, so fever, uh, unstable blood pressure, profuse sweating, dyspnea, so breathing problems, muscle rigidity, hyperreflexia, so these are some of, some of these uh, locomotor types of effects, incontinence, and the patient will move muscles throughout the body and it may last for days. So they may be constantly, constantly moving, twitching, adjusting their, their legs, their, their face, their mouth, their tongue. Um, all of that stuff, and it and it just may keep going on and on and on. So really, you would want to take them off the uh, off the neuroleptic, off that antipsychotic drug. Uh, you can also treat them with agonists because antipsychotic drugs are antagonists; they block things. So um, and which is probably causing the problem. So you can treat them with an agonist, and it'll it'll give some of that. Uh, It'll relieve some of those symptoms. So your first generation conventional antipsychotics. So the prototype drug, chlorpromazine, also called uh, uh, Thorazine. But haloperidol is one that you're probably going to see probably even more than you'll see chlorpromazine. Um, but so, so that's an important drug, and it's considered conventional.
So mechanism of action, inhibitor primarily of that dopamine D2 receptor, but, and this is the case for atypicals as well, but it also hits the histamine receptor, acetylcholine, and it's a blocker of these, okay? So that's why we see anticholinergic effects, because it does affect acetylcholine receptors. Uh, also norepinephrine, uh, which can cause some of the uh, uh, postural hypertension, hypo, hypotension, okay? Um, or orthostatic hypotension. So hopefully these make sense. Some of the sedation probably comes from blocking histamine, so it's kind of an antihistamine, anticholinergic, anti-norepinephrine as well. But primarily the therapeutic effect comes from the dopamine uh, antagonism. So primary therapeutic use, acute and chronic psychotic disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar, Tourette, prevention of nausea, vomiting, that comes from blocking some of those receptors in the brainstem, uh, tend to be used for severe mental illness. And honestly, they, they tend to be used more short term <clears throat> than, uh, than the atypicals. So the adverse effects, there's a whole bunch of them. Sedation, well, uh, you know, it has antihistamine type of effect. Um, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, that's that toxicity, can cause liver impairment, anticholinergic, well, yeah, that's from, because it's, uh, it also affects uh, acetylcholine receptors, orthostatic hypertension, that's probably from norepinephrine, uh, dysrhythmia is also probably from norepinephrine, don't know. Uh, sexual dysfunction, seizures, agranulocytosis, so, uh, so this has an effect on, has an effect on bone marrow. And uh, gynomastia, which probably has something to do with like um, prolactin. Prolactin is really just, just dopamine. So um, <clears throat> so it can cause, cause a problem there, it may, maybe that, but it causes endocrine disorders in general. And that could be any kind of neurotransmission that's happening in the brain that's not happening right. Uh, also skin effects, I'm not sure where that comes from, but, but you see it. And then these EPS, the extrapyramidal side, effect, side effects or extrapyramidal symptoms. Um, acute dystonia, which is the tongue, neck, and face spasms, and that can be a, a crisis type of situation, okay? Uh, so, so keep that in mind. Acute, I have, I have it underlined, acute dystonia, yeah, that's something that, that you don't want to see. Um, and uh, Parkinsonism, remember that we're blocking dopamine. Parkinson's disease is a low level of dopamine, so that makes sense. So some of that rigidity that you see with Parkinson's. Uh, akathisia, inability to sit still or pacing. And then tardive dyskinesia in long-term use. All right, atypicals. A little more fun. Um, so risperidone is the prototype, but also things like olanzapine, which is Zeprexa, ketiapine, which is Seroquel, clozapine, clozaril, aripiprazole, which is Abilify. These are all commonly used. It's not, oh, it's risperidone and then maybe some of these others. These are very commonly used. In fact, clozapine, if it didn't cause agranulocytosis, would probably be the preferred drug, uh, but it can cause some, uh, it seems to have more of an effect on, on bone marrow. So, um, so it's not used as much as it could be. Um, they tend to act as uh, dopamine and serotonin system stabilizers. It's kind of a uh, kind of a nice sounding term, system stabilizer. But really, they're antagonists at both the serotonin and the dopamine receptors, particularly that D2 receptor for dopamine and the 2A receptor for uh, serotonin. But remember, they also work and antagonize, okay, you gotta keep that straight, they're antagonists. They antagonize other symptoms as well. So the advantage is that atypicals can treat both the positive and negative symptoms. The negative probably, hypothetically, uh, comes from that 2A, the serotonin antagonism. And then new drug class approved in 2002, some people call it the, the third generation, but that's, that's where aripiprazole kind of kind of comes in, and that may have a dopamine, dopamine agonist activity. And uh, it just has a lower incidence of serious side effects uh, compared to other antipsychotic drugs, which is true for most of the atypicals. They have fewer side effects um, than, uh, than like the, uh, 
the first generation for sure. So atypicals are the first line of treatment for schizophrenia. If you're if a patient has been diagnosed and uh, they get treatment for it, they will probably end up getting an atypical antipsychotic. Okay, because of, like I said, more effective with fewer side effects. So let's look at your prototype drug. At least the ATI prototype drug is risperidone or risperdal. And its mechanism, it's an antagonist at serotonin receptors and dopamine receptors, but we have to remember it also antagonizes several other systems, and that's why we still have this list of adverse effects down here. Uh, primary therapeutic use, well, schizo schizophrenia spectrum disorder, psychotic episodes induced by levodopa theory used in Parkinson's disease therapy. Um, and, uh, yeah, because you're increasing dopamine. Um, or you're increasing, or you're decreasing uh, dopamine binding. So bipolar disorder is also included in there, impulse control disorders, and these are effective for positive and negative symptoms. Okay, so the adverse effects, weight gain. Now it depends on the drugs, like uh, I think catiapine, um, I'd have to go back and double check, may, may cause uh, more weight gain than others, so if that's a problem, you may want to avoid that one. Hyperlipidemia, diabetes mellitus, these all kind of fit into the uh, to the same category, but diabetes can be a big problem. People will gain, you know, 100 pounds. And so, um, so that's in addition to having schizophrenia, uh, they, they're going to have to uh, probably watch their dietary intake of things like saturated fats orthostatic hypotension, probably from norepinephrine blockade, uh, anticholinergic effects, obviously from blocking and, uh, acetylcholine, and then agitation, dizziness, sedation, sleep disruption, mild EPS, so they, you still do see extrapyramidal side effects, but, and this is kind of important, you don't see as many extrapyramidal side effects with the atypicals because they're not hitting that dopamine D2 receptor as hard. Okay, elevated prolactin could be, it has been seen, sexual dysfunction is still a problem, um, even with the, uh, with the atypicals. Okay, well that's it for uh, antipsychotics. This is just, these are just some definitions of all the terms that we just went over.